Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon for the second of our webinar series um, on the heat network metering billing regulations. Uh, my name is Thomas Penson and I'm the enforcement team leader for the heat networks team within OPSS um, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, so I'm going to run through the introductions and go for a little bit of housekeeping and, and explain how the webinar will run and then I'll pass off to the presentation and return for some Q&A later on. So apart from myself today, there are um, several colleagues from OPSS sitting on the production side of things. So um, Hussein is one of our senior enforcement um, one of our senior enforcement officers who's going to be taking us through your presentation today. And we've got Scott, Nora, Lloyd and Michael who's going to be helping answer questions alongside Hussein and myself. And we also have a couple of colleagues from our connections team, um, Georgina and Safina, who are going to be helping us with the administration side today. So we're going to take questions in written form. So um, there's a Q&A tab in the right, top right hand corner um, and you can post questions here anonymously if you wish or with your own details. Um, and we'll try and answer them either throughout the presentation or at the end in the voiced Q&A session. Um, if there is a question that you want to ask that someone has already posted, please use the like function and we'll try and answer the questions that have the most likes first so they can get dealt with um, ahead of time. Um, we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can today, um, but there will be some questions that um, we need to go away and look at more closely and won't be able to answer on the spot. Or if we run out of time, we, we will be picking them up after the session and we will circulate a Q&A document post webinar. This may take us some time, but it will go out to all the attendees. Um, the session is being recorded today. Um, the recording will only include the production side of things, so you don't need to worry about yourselves being recorded. And the recording will be made available to all the attendees who wish to re-watch re the session in the future or won't be able to, haven't been able to catch it today. Um, this will be available shortly after the webinars. We'll be aiming to finish today at around three o'clock once we've gone through the presentation and gone through the Q&A side of things. Um, so for now, that's all from me. I'm going to hand over to Hussein, who um, is going to take us through the presentation today. So Hussein, do you want to take us away? Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, so uh, hello everybody. My name is Hussein Hussein, and I'm a, uh, a senior compliance officer as part of the Heat Networks team here at OPSS. Um, our team enforces the heat network metering and billing regulations by engaging with heat suppliers and ensuring compliance with regulatory obligations. The topics we'll be talking about today are firstly uh, building class, which is a concept introduced in the 2020 amendments to the heat network regulations and the cost effectiveness tool, which has been developed to assess the cost effectiveness of installing metering devices. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, OK, so we'll start by providing some background information about the relevant regulations and core concepts which underpin the addition of building classes to the regulations, as well as the cost effectiveness tool. So this will include regulations four and regulation six, which covers meter installation. Uh, regulation 2A, where the concept of building classes were introduced in 2020, and the two main types of heat networks, which are communal and district. So we'll then explain what building classes are, and we'll talk about the three types of building classes in detail, which are the viable class, the open class, and the exempt class. Uh, we'll be looking at how these are defined in the regulations and how we can identify them correctly, as well as what the requirements are for heat suppliers. Um, after that, we'll give an overview of the cost effectiveness tool to clarify when it is needed and how to go about completing it. So we'll discuss the two template variants available, which are the reduced input cost effectiveness tool, or RSET for short, and the full input cost effectiveness tool known as the FSET. Uh, we'll give a breakdown of each section of the form and what information needs to be provided uh, in order to complete the forms. Lastly, we'll speak a bit about key dates and deadlines for compliance, particularly the upcoming 1st of September 2022 deadline, and discuss the next steps that should be taken going forward to ensure compliance. And finally, uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, yeah, so. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. OK, so. Firstly, um, to effectively understand what building classes are, uh, we need to situate them in the context of the wider regulations. 
So in essence, building classes are what determine the metering requirements for buildings on a network. So we're going to firstly discuss regulations four and regulation six, both of which focus on the installation of various metering devices. So starting with regulation four, uh, which is the duty to install metering devices. This regulation stipulates that heat suppliers must carry out the installation of metering devices where it is technically feasible and cost effective to do so. Here, metering devices refers primarily to building level meters and final customer meters. Building level meters are used by heat suppliers to measure the consumption of heating, cooling, or hot water for a single building on a district multi-building network. They must be installed in all district networks, regardless of building class. Uh, final customer meters are used to measure consumption of heat, cooling, or hot water by a final customer, and each of these meters must be accompanied by a temperature control device, which allows customers to control their consumption. This allows final customers to be more uh, efficient, uh, to more efficiently manage their consumption and is designed to encourage positive behavioral change. So in this case, final customer meters can lower their consumption by adjusting these devices and at the same time lowering their expenditure. Depending on what class a building falls into on any given network, there are different metering requirements. So for example, final customer meters for buildings in the viable class are always mandatory, and they should also be fitted for buildings in the open class unless it is not technically feasible or cost effective to do so. This is determined by the outcome of the cost effectiveness tool. Next slide, please. Thank you, uh, great. So. So regulation six covers the duty to install heat cost allocators, uh, thermostatic radiator valves and hot water meters. These devices must be installed in certain circumstances where one or more of the following criteria applies. So where there is more than one final customer in a building supplied by a district heat network or communal heating, where the heat supplier supplies both heating and hot water to the building, and where the heat supplier supplies both heating and hot and um, and where the heat supplier has determined that it is not cost effective or technically feasible to install final customer meters, but that it is for heat cost allocators. If the CET shows that it is not cost effective for either, that installation is not required. In terms of uh, what each, each of these meters do, so um, heat cost allocators are used to record the consumption of heat by room heating radiators within a customer's premises. Thermostatic radiator valves that uh, much like thermostatic control devices are used to allow the customer to, the ability to control their consumption uh, by these room, room, uh, room heating radiators. And hot water meters, uh, as the name suggests, uh, are used to record the consumption of hot water by a customer. Next slide, please. Okay, so. In accordance with the 2020 uh, amendments to the heat network metering billing regulation 2014, regulation 2A introduced three categories of uh, building classes. These building classes determine where metering devices must be installed and where they are not required through the means of exemption or the results of the cost effectiveness tool assessment. So, uh, so both building class and the type of network shape the metering requirements for buildings on any given network. And building class also determines if there is a need to carry out analysis of technical feasibility and cost effectiveness. It is important to state here that building class determination is done at the building level uh, rather than at the network level. Heat suppliers must calculate building class determination for each building on a network and must include this information in the heat notification submission template. It should also uh, be noted that buildings can move between classes due to changing circumstances and that the type of heat network, either district or communal, affects the metering requirements for each building class. Three building classes are viable, open and exempt, uh, which we will have an in-depth look at in a moment. Uh, but first, we'll quickly clarify what we mean by district and communal heating. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are, broadly speaking, there are two types of heat networks as defined in the regulations, uh, communal heat networks and district heat networks. Communal heat networks allow for the distribution of thermal energy to a single building with at least two or more final customers. 
So for example, a block of flats with a single boiler or a shop with a flat above it. And uh, district heat networks, which are used to supply multiple buildings with at least one final customer. Examples can be uh, citywide uh, municipal, uh, can I say this word? Yeah. Um, <laughs> heating, hospitals, university campuses, and our student halls of residence. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll now introduce the uh, three main types of building classes. So firstly, it's uh, the viable class. Buildings in the viable class must have meters installed in order to be compliant with the regulations. Uh, buildings in this class would include newly const uh, constructed buildings connected to a district network on or after the 18th of December 2014, when the heat network regulations first came into the force, or newly constructed buildings connected to a communal network on or after the 1st of September 2022. Um, this building class also includes buildings that undergo major renovations relating to technical services uh, as defined in the regulations on or after the 27th of November 2020, when they uh, when the amendments uh, to the regulations took place. Uh, heat meter installation is mandatory for any buildings in the viable class. Next, we have buildings in the open class. A vast majority of buildings fall into this category. Generally, if the building does not fall into the viable class or exempt classes, then it would fall into the open class. Buildings in this class require that heat suppliers carry out a cost effectiveness tool analysis, which would indicate whether meter installation is required or not. Meters must be installed in these buildings unless the cost effectiveness tool analysis states that it is not cost effective to install meters. And finally, we have buildings in the exempt class. A building would be in the exempt class if it meets one of the following three criteria. Firstly, the building is exempt if it is used wholly or partly as supported housing, almshouse accommodation, or purpose-built student accommodation. Uh, the second is if there is a lease exemption. So if there is a lease that took effect before the 27th of November 2020, when the amendments were uh, were introduced and, uh, and covers more than 10% of total premises in the building which prevents consumption based billing for customers of the network. And thirdly, if the building consists mainly of non domestic premises and the network transfers heating or cooling using means other than steam or water. Buildings in the exempt class do not have to install uh, metering devices or complete cost effectiveness uh, tool analysis. So we can see that the main purpose of building classification is that it determines where meters must be installed and where they don't have to be through means of exemption or cost effectiveness. Now we'll have a look at each building class and the requirements for heat suppliers in practice. Next slide, please. So firstly, the viable class. Uh, heat meters are always mandatory for buildings in this class. Uh, and there isn't a need to complete a cost effectiveness tool analysis as meters are always required. Buildings in the viable class focus primarily on newly constructed buildings. So for buildings on a district network, uh, this would apply to newly constructed buildings connected to a district network on or after the 27th of November 2020 and includes new buildings added to existing heat networks as well as those constructed before the 27th of November 2020 but connected on or after this date. So to reiterate, uh, this date is re uh, referring to when the amendments to the regulations were introduced. The building class would also include um, buildings that undergo major renovations relating to technical services as uh, defined in the regulations, and this would be on or after the 27th of November 2020. So major renovations uh, would be defined as the renovation of a building where the total cost of the renovation of the building envelope or the technical services is higher than 25% of the value of the building, excluding the value of the land upon which the building is situated. These are classified as viable because there is an opportunity to install meters without retrofitting. Uh, this class also includes existing buildings where meter installations have previously been mandatory as well as buildings for which meter installations were mandatory between the 18th of December 2014 and before November 2020. Newly constructed buildings connected to a communal network on or after the 1st of September 
2022 will also fall into the viable class. Next slide, please. So here we have a breakdown of what uh, kind of buildings would fall into the viable class in relation to the type of network they're on. Uh, I just want to uh, state here that this table is available in the guidance document published on our website. Um, so again, for buildings supplied by a district heat network, any newly constructed building supplied via district heat network on or after the 27th of November 2020 would fall into the viable class. And for communal, any newly constructed building which is connected to a communal heat network on or after the 1st of September 2022 would also fall into the viable class, as well as any building that may have been constructed before the 1st of September 2022, but was connected to the communal network after this date. It also states that some new buildings with communal heating may fall into the open class or exempt class, such as if they already have meters installed, they may fall into the open class, all of which we'll have a look at in a moment. Um, we can also see that for district networks, buildings that undergo major renovations relating to technical services on or after the 27th of November 2020 would fall into the viable class. Uh, next slide, please. As for the open class, the vast majority of buildings fall into this category. Essentially, if the building does not fall into the viable or exempt classes, then it would fall into the open class. Buildings in the open class are required to install meters or heat uh, cost allocators for each customer unless it is not technically feasible or cost effective to do so. The cost effectiveness of installing meters can be calculated using the cost effectiveness tool. In many cases, buildings with metering devices already installed will fall into this class as those devices are already there. Um, so for district networks, any existing building that does not fall into the viable or exempt class and was not originally constructed to be connected to the district network, um, but is connected on or after the date when the amendments came into effect, which is the 27th of November 2020, would fall into the open class. For communal networks, any newly constructed building that does not fall into the exempt class and is connected to communal heating on or after the 27th of November 2020, but before the 1st of September 2022 would fall into the open class. The distinction here between viable and open class is that newly constructed buildings, um, which is connected to a communal network within this roughly two year period between 2020 and 2022, these buildings would fall into the open class, whereas buildings connected to communal networks on or after the 1st of September 2022 would fall into the viable class. Any newly constructed building that does not fall into the exempt class and is connected to a communal heat network on or after the 1st of September 2022, where any of the following apply, where there is uh, more than one entry point for the pipe network or any part of the building is supported housing, almshouse accommodations or purpose built student accommodation would fall into the open class. Other buildings that would fall into the open class are any other existing buildings that are not in the exempt class, which refers to any building that was not originally constructed to be connected at a later stage on or after the 27th of November 2020. Buildings in the open class must install meters unless cost, uh, cost effectiveness tool analysis deems that meter installation is not cost effective. If the results of the cost effectiveness tool analysis show that it is indeed cost effective, then meters must be installed. If meters have already been installed in an open class building, there is no requirement to complete a CET. Next slide, please. So for buildings connected to a district heat network, as we can see from the two boxes on the uh, on the bottom left there, um, Newly constructed buildings or buildings which have had major renovations can be ruled out as they would fall into the viable class. That is unless they already have meters installed. You can also see that buildings that wouldn't fall into the other two classes would, would fall into the open class. For communal buildings, so that's the first two boxes on the right, um, hi they, these highlight two key dates with slightly different connotations to what would be classed as a building in the open class on a communal network. 
So as stated earlier, buildings in the open class would require heat suppliers to complete a cost effectiveness tool analysis to assess the cost effectiveness of these buildings. So to summarize for clarity, for district heat networks, the open class would not include newly constructed buildings connected on or after the 27th of November 2020. Those would fall into the viable class. The open class covers all existing buildings that do not fall into the viable class or those that fail uh, th that fall into the exempt class, which will will look at in a moment. Um, for communal heat uh, networks, however, newly constructed buildings connected between the 27th of November 2020 and the 31st of August 2022, which which is just um, just before the 1st of September 2022 deadline um, that do not fall into the exempt class would be classed as being in the open class. Newly constructed buildings connected on or after the 1st of September 2022 that do not fall in the exempt class can fall into the open class depending on either of these two factors. So if there are multiple pipe entry points into the customer's premises or the building is used wholly as part or, or partly as supported housing, arms house accommodation or purpose built student accommodation. If any of these is the case then the building would fall to the open class. Next slide, please. Now we'll have a look at the exempt class. Buildings that fall into this class uh, do not have to install final customer meters. Uh, but it is important to note that other requirements under the regulations, such as the need to install building level meters in district networks and the duty to notify, still apply. The exemption is just for the final customer meter installation. So for district networks, if an existing building that does not fall into the viable class and where there are any parts of the building that is supported housing, arms house accommodation or purpose built student accommodation, this building would fall into the exempt class. Buildings on a district network may also fall into the exempt class if any of the following conditions apply. If an existing building that does not fall into the viable class and where more than 10% of the total number of private dwellings and non-domestic premises are subject to leasehold interest, where these began before the 27th of November 2020 and where the lease contains any provisions that would prevent billing by uh, based on consumption. Uh, buildings would also fall into the exempt class if the building in question does not consist mainly of private dwellings and where heat is distributed by means of a system other than hot water or the cooling system uses transfer fluid other than water. For communal networks, buildings that are newly constructed and do not consist primarily of private dwellings and are connected to communal heating on or after the 27th of November 2020, and where heat is distributed by means of a system other than hot water or, or cooling system, which uses transfer fluid other than water, would fall into the exempt class. Uh, existing buildings, existing buildings uh, where more than 10% of the total number of private dwellings and non-domestic premises are subject to leasehold interest and where the lease began before the 27th of November 2020, and contains provisions which would prevent billing by consumption would fall into the exempt class. And finally, um, existing buildings on a communal network uh, would also be considered exempt where heat is distributed by means of a system other than hot water or a cooling system which uses a transfer fluid other than water. Next slide, please. OK, so here we have a breakdown of the exempt class. Generally speaking, uh, there are three grounds for exemption which apply to both district and communal heat networks. So the first is if a building or any part of the building is being used as supported housing, arms house accommodation, or purpose-built student accommodation. Uh, the second refers to uh, leasehold interest where more than 10% of the total number of private uh, dwellings and non-domestic premises are subject to leasehold interest where the lease began before the 27th of November 2020 and where the lease contains provisions which would prevent billing based on consumption. And the third is that an existing building which consists primarily of non-domestic premises and the heating or cooling transfer method is, you, uh, is something other than steam, water or chilled liquids. I'd like to point out again that this table and the information on building classes available on our uh, in our heat uh, network guidance document, the link to which is on our website. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
OK, so now that we've gone over the building classes in a bit of detail. Uh, we'll take a look at the cost effectiveness tool or CET for short. The underlying assumption of effective uh, metering and billing by consumption is that cons consumption patterns will change, but heat, uh, customers are more aware of how much heat they are consuming. In essence, the idea is to encourage positive behavioral change by allowing customers to use their heat more efficiently by controlling consumption, lowering costs for themselves, which will then lower the environmental impact of heating. However, installing meters can be costly for heat suppliers, and it is important to, to, to determine if it is cost effective by weighing the benefits and costs of the installation. So in order to help heat suppliers calculate this, the cost effectiveness tool has been developed to support heat suppliers in assessing whether it is cost effective to install metering devices for buildings that fall into the open class. The process of submitting a cost effectiveness tool analysis would need to be included with a notification submission in the appropriate circumstances, and particularly when the cost effectiveness tool analysis results are negative, meaning meter installation is not cost effective, as well as if requested by the OPSS. There are, is a requirement to resubmit cost effectiveness tool analysis results every four years if this is the case. If the test results are positive, indicating that meter installation would be cost effective, then heat suppliers must install meters as stipulated in the regulations. If the result is negative for installing heat meters and or heat cost allocators, then meter installation would not be required. Next slide, please. So there are two variants of the cost effectiveness tool spreadsheet available for heat suppliers to use. The tool itself estimates the cost of meter installation based on factors such as capital, installation, operation, and maintenance costs of the, of the meters. Uh, a full breakdown of these factors is available under Schedule 1 of the regulations. So uh, the first is the Reduced Input Cost Effectiveness Tool, or RSET. This variant is intended to enable heat suppliers to assess a single building on their network. Uh, to establish the cost effectiveness of installing meters there. The reduced input cost effectiveness tool should be used when the actual energy consumption for a building is known and a quote for meter installation costs is available. So in simpler terms, this sheet should be completed if you already know how much energy you consume to generate heat and also have a quote from a metering provider which can be entered to provide actual installation costs. The second is the full input cost effectiveness tool or FSET, which is best used when the energy consumption of a building is estimated or if a quote for meter installation costs is not available, even if the energy consumption is known. This is a much larger input form compared to the reduced input cost effectiveness tool as more information is needed. Unlike the RSET, the full input cost effectiveness tool does not impose a one size fits all approach to assessing cost effectiveness and is much more flexible. Buildings are added by the user and against each building, the user sets out either the actual consumption of the building or the heat and or cooling plant used to supply energy to the building's individual units. We'll now take a look at both of the template uh, sheets. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So here we have a snip of the reduced uh, input cost effectiveness tool spreadsheet. The first section here requires that the input of the network and building information, such as network name and location and building input, uh, which is the name that of that building that is being assessed for installation. The reduced input cost effectiveness tool only allows the input of a single building at a time, whereas the full input cost effectiveness tool allows you to enter as many buildings as needed. So if you were using a reduced input cost effectiveness tool, you would need to create an instance of it for each building that you're appraising rather than having it in a single spreadsheet. Next slide, please. The second section here, section 2A, refers to fuel consumption. It allows a user to enter 12 months of fuel costs and accompanying information. The tool aims to evaluate the annual savings that are forecast to be delivered through the installation of a heat meter or heat cost allocator. And as such, it needs relevant information to assess the fuel consumption 
for a single building over the year provided by the heat network. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have a breakdown of what the questions consist of in this section. So heat suppliers need to provide a description of the fuel being used, uh, the fuel type, which can be selected via the drop down menu. The options include um, fuel types such as biofuel, biomass, electric, gas, oil. Um, heat suppliers also need to include information on consumption in kilowatt hour and the number of months the consumption relates to. There are also optional fields such as marginal cost of fuel, relevant consumption levies, and fixed charge over consumption period. These optional uh, fields may also apply to certain situations and as such aren't mandatory. Heat suppliers must also apply the total fuel cost over the consumption period and the output cost, uh, output energy from fuel. So this can be heat, cooling, or both heat and cooling. Most fuel types will typically be used to deliver either heat or cooling. However, some fuel types might be used to deliver both, such as electricity, waste, waste heat recovery. Next slide, please. Uh, the next section, section three, asks about the unit types within a building. A building unit reflects uh, different types of heating and or cooling supplied with, customer, uh, with customers within a given building. So again, there's a drop down menu here, which includes various building archetypes. This selection also determines whether a building is predominantly domestic or non domestic. Uh, it asks for total number of units and dwellings in a building and also the total number of heat meters required. This is based on the installer quote and should therefore include the prices of meters. The next question asks if users can change controls. Or in other words, are there any form of temperature control devices such as thermostatic radiator valve in installed, which would allow final customers to control their consumption and effectively encourage positive behavioral change. This section also asks for total number of hot water meters. So the total number of hot water meters required across all units. Uh, this is the same with heat cost allocators and thermostatic radiator valves and is generally based on the installer quote. Next slide, please. So this next section, uh, section four, refers to quoted costs. Essentially, this is asking how much it would cost you to install meters. The metering cost inputs reflect the different costs associated in installing meters or heat cost allocators in a building. These costs must be based on installer quotes. So for example, heat meter uh, cost installation would be the cost for each meter that you have and how much it costs to purchase and install. Uh, there is also a question regarding the cost of installing data gathering equipment. So the costs of the infrastructure that allows us to gather the data from the heat meter. This should be calculated per unit or dwelling. So to recap, there are four main sections included in the reduced input cost effectiveness tool. Network and building information, fuel cons uh, consumption, unit types within the building and quoted costs. After completing these sections, the next uh, step would be the output appraisal tab, uh, which would allow you to see the results of the calculations, which would indicate if meter installation is cost effective or not. There's also an integrity check tab, uh, which displays if information has been included in relevant mandatory sections. Uh, we'll have a look at these in a moment. Um, next slide, please. OK, so now we'll do a run through of the full input cost effectiveness tool. So this tool is uh, designed to be used when the energy consumption of a building is estimated or if a quote for meter installation costs is not available, even if the energy consumption is known. It's very similar to the uh, reduced input cost effectiveness tool, but we, uh, we can include a lot more information here. Uh, we can include as many buildings as necessary, whereas the reduced input cost effectiveness tool can only assess one building at a time. Next slide, please. So if you have a look here at section one, again, it asks for network and building information such as network name and location. It then asks for building name and fuel costs for the building. There is a lot more detail required here. So for example, the materials used in the construction of the building, 
such as the walls and floors. There's a drop down menu with several options for materials. These include external wall construction types such as stone walls, solid brick, dense or precast concrete walls and uh, timber frame walls uh, to name a few. It also asks for information about floor construction material, floor fabric efficiency and roof construction materials such as flat concrete, pitched or sheet metal roofs. So, um, next slide please. This next section, refer, uh, section 2A refers to fuel consumption. Fuel consumption for the building over 12 months. Um, you can add as many buildings as needed to the form. So there's a lot more flexible. Heat suppliers can enter their own building level consumption in section 2A and in section 2B, the specific heat or cooling plant used to supply the building can be included. Similarly to the uh, reduced input cost effectiveness tool, information about the fuel, fuel type, consumption and total fuel cost over consumption period must be provided in this section. Next slide, please. So this next section, section 2B, refers to the heat generating plants within or outside the building. The aim of this section is to build a picture of the mix of energy generating plants involved in supplying a given building. Uh, this section requires heat suppliers to give a description of the network. So things like the name of the plant, number of units of the plant type, if the plant is inside or outside the building. Heat suppliers also need to provide information about plant building inputs whether it is inside or outside the building, like we said, the type of fuel and associated cost. Fuel types can include various types of fuels, such as biofuel, gas, electricity. Information about how efficient the plant is, is also, uh, also needs to be provided here. So thermal capacity and efficiency and availability of the plant during the year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, section three is about the unit types within the buildings. This section goes into more detail than the reduced input cost effectiveness tool. Uh, heat suppliers will need to provide unit type name and archetypes such as cold store, general retail or residential. This also gives an indication of the occupancy class classification that the unit would fall into, such as industrial, commercial or residential. Information on space of the unit is also required as well as glazing, ins insulation, and the number of heat meters required if known. Next slide, please. Okay, so both the reduced input cost effectiveness tool and the full input cost effectiveness tool spreadsheets have a tab dedicated to confirming the integrity of the information provided. These checks confirm if mandatory information about the network, buildings, plants, and units has been included in the correct sections. So there's a, ch a check indicator at the top of the user input form, which shows whether all integrity checks have been made. Uh, if the check shows as incomplete, heat suppliers can refer to the integrity tab to which, uh, which dis uh, displays the areas which may require amending. So for example, on the bottom right is an integrity check that is complete as information has been provided correctly while on the left, the test shows that information is either missing or incomplete. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So both of these uh, forms also include an appraisal tab. If adequate information has been entered for all of the network's buildings, plants, and building unit types, and the integrity check is complete, this tab will provide the heat supplier with the assessment of whether A, heat meters should be installed, and failing that, B, if heat cost allocators should be installed. Um, so the example here shows that the assessment results indicate that heat meters are not required, as a result is false, uh, while heat cost allocators are required, as the result is true. All of this information, as well as an in-depth breakdown of each component, is available in the CET guidance document, which is available on the Heat Network's website. Next slide, please. Okay, 
Here we have two key dates that are relevant when it comes to both building class and the cost effectiveness tool. So the first deadline is the 27th of November 2021, which has now passed. Heat suppliers must have determined the correct building class by this first deadline. And where required, the cost effectiveness tool assessment must have been completed by this first deadline. Uh, this is an obligation in the regulations, but non-completion does not constitute an offense. However, uh, failing to complete a cost effectiveness tool assessment by this first deadline will have an impact on the ability of a heat supplier to meet uh, other obligations. So, for example, uh, if a heat supplier fails to complete a cost effectiveness tool assessment in time, and subsequently fails to install heat meters or heat cost allocators in time for the 1st of September 2022 deadline, uh, which is the metering deadline as well. They will be liable for penalties under regulations thir uh, regulation 13 in relation to regulations 4 and 6. Cost effectiveness tool assessments do not automatically need to be submitted to the OPSS by heat suppliers, but they must, <clears throat> excuse me, but they must complete and retain copies of it and submit them to the OPSS on request. So, and the second deadline, from the 1st of September 2022, which is the upcoming deadline, uh, heat suppliers must be compliant with all applicable regulations. Meters must have been installed by the state, and heat suppliers must have submitted a new notification if the renotification deadline of four years fell into the transitional period. Please note that uh, not having complied with all transitional requirements is an offense. OPSS may seek evidence that obligations have been met and may also take action where they have uh, where they have not. Uh, next slide, please. So, going forward, um, heat suppliers must ensure that they are compliant with the regulations and any CETs are completed and submitted where required, particularly if the results are negative. Heat suppliers should make sure that plans are underway to have meters installed where required ahead of the 1st of September 2022 deadline. They should also notify the OPSS with building class determination if not done so already, as well as relevant cost effectiveness tool analysis data and meter installation information at the time of the next notification submission. That's a mouthful. Renotifications must be submitted within four years of the initial notification, and this is a rolling requirement for each notification. And uh, heat suppliers should uh, contact the OPSS as soon as possible if there are any issues with installing meters or completing the cost effectiveness tool analysis. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we've included some useful links and resources, particularly the first link uh, here is for our web page where majority of the information displayed here is available. We have also included our email address, which can be used to contact us directly with any inquiries or up updates. Some of the information available on our web page includes guidance documents for completing notifications and CET submissions, as well as the appropriate templates. We also uh, we have also recently published a short video uh, that outlines what building classes are in a concise manner, the link to which is available at the bottom of the slide there. We are also in the process of publishing a video on the cost effectiveness tool, which outlines what the cost effectiveness tool is. This will ideally be made available very soon. Um, can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> right, uh, if there's any questions, I'll hand back over to Tom and uh, we can answer those. <clears throat> 